lifting up Jesus, opening his word from Australia, Denmark, Israel, Japan, New Zealand, Northern Ireland, Republic of Ireland, Singapore, South Africa, United Kingdom, Thailand, the Philippines, United States, and throughout the world. You're watching Morial TV. Hi, this is Tim with Morial TV and Morial Radio here live in the States with James Jacob Prash, um, who is going to be, you want, you want to check the schedule to make sure uh, that you go out and see Jacob if he's appearing in an area near you. That would be, of course, on morial.org. We've gotten many questions about people who think there may be certain discrepancies within the gospel. Uh, Jacob, could you generally expound on that, how s somebody looking at it may think of it as a discrepancy, but it all works together with the four gospel writers? Absolutely. You ask about the gospels, bearing in mind you have the same, I wouldn't call it phenomena, but the same occurrences that appear to be contradictory throughout the Old Testament. In other words, Kings and Chronicles reporting on the same episode might emphasize different details. Or the prophet writing about it. Isaiah is writing about the times of Hezekiah. So is Chronicles. So is Kings. The detail will be slightly different. There will be a structural delineation between what the prophet says, what Chronicle says, and what King says. Well, why is that? Well, Kings is written from a biographical perspective. The prophets are written from a prophetic perspective. And Chronicles was written from a historical perspective. They're all telling the same story from different angles, much the same as if you had three different statements from three different witnesses of an accident or a crime. If they're interviewed separately, they'll all tell the police the same essential details, but there will be things that one would include and the others would not. They may not have seen it, they may not have thought it was important to tell the police that, another might person would. The Gospels are like anything else, it's like the Old Testament. So let's understand this. Jesus is fully human and fully divine. Fully human and fully divine. He's not 50-50. He's 100% and 100%. The scripture is the same. It's 100% human and 100% divine. The Gospel of John is 100% the Word of God and 100% the word of John. Matthew is 100% the word of God and 100% the word of Matthew. It is the word of God in the word of man, much as in the word became flesh. Jesus is God in man. The scripture is the word of God in the word of man. The Holy Spirit inspired them to write it, but we see the character, the background, the ministry of each gospel author being emphasized. Now we can begin with theme, theme. Each gospel conveys some aspect of Christ as a theme. John's theme is that Christ is divine. He's pointing to the deity of Jesus as God. Matthew is regal or royal. He's pointing to the Davidic kingship of Christ. Luke focuses on the servant nature of Christ. Matthew, the king, John, the divine, and Mark, the human aspect of Jesus. Each is emphasizing in theme a different aspect of him. So the details they will include will be the details necessary to communicate 
the theme they're trying to put across. Now understand what I'm saying. As literary genre, and I've explained this before, but we'll go through it again. As literary genre, the Gospels are narratives that have historicity. The Gospels are narratives with historicity. What does that mean? They are true stories. They're not fairy tales. They're not mythologized. They are true stories, actual accounts. However, they are told in the form of a story, a narrative, an account. They're not written as a history book. When I was a little boy in New York, I had two books I read on the American Civil War. One was Bruce Catton's pictorial history of the Civil War. Now, it wasn't a picture book. It just was a book that had a lot of photos and paintings and maps in it. But it was well written. It was semi-academic. Um, it was an intelligently written book. But it had saturation of a saturation of photos and maps and paintings from the period. Okay. That was Bruce Catton. That was written as history. But then I read a book by an author from Newark, New Jersey, famous author, Stephen Crane, who wrote a book called The Red Badge of Courage. Red Badge of fam famous book in the United States and other countries, particularly the United States, famous book. They're describing things like the Battle of Shiloh from two different perspectives. One is objective, telling you what happened in terms of the military history. The other is telling you what happened in a biographical sense, what it was like to be there and experience it, the story of the Red Badge and Courage. Okay, it was, I suppose you call it the genre, we call it docufiction. Docufiction. <clears throat> The scriptures are the same. The gospels are the same. They emphasize different detail. Pay attention. Just like Genesis 1 to 11. Genesis 1 to 11 is a narrative that has historicity. It is a true story of the creation and the flood. But it is not a history book of the creation. The book of Job speaks more of the history of the creation than Genesis does, and it tells us we don't know how God did these things. But some people misread Genesis 1 to 11 as a history book instead of a narrative. It is a narrative with historicity. In other words, it's a true story. That's its genre. You wouldn't read a user's manual for a microwave oven the same way you'd read a Shakespearean sonnet. You read different kinds of literature with different presuppositions. Well, scripture's the same. God uses different literary genre or kinds of literature to convey different truths. Genesis 1 to 11 is a narrative with historicity, a true story. Why do I say this? Because Genesis 1 to 11 and the Gospels, although they are historically true in the sense that they have historicity, the historical events they write about are true and accurate, valid. Their purpose as literature, as God inspired them to be written, is not primarily to tell us what happened. It's the theological interpretation of what happened. History and historicity. The Gospels are the theological interpretation of the history of Jesus. Genesis 1-11 to is the theological interpretation of the creation and the flood, the Diluvian Age. True stories have historicity, it really happened. But don't misread Genesis 1 to 11 as a science book on the creation 
or even as a history book, Job tells us we don't know how God did some of these things. Read it for what it is. A narrative with historicity, a true story that theologically interprets the history of what happened. Genesis was written in part by Moses under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit as a polemic against the pagan myths that were half true. You had Adam and Eve stories in Egypt. You have the uh, Epic of Gilgamesh, an alternative account of Noah. The scriptures give the account that is historically accurate and the interpretation of what happened against these pagan narratives, these other distorted versions. Now, these other distorted versions do prove that there actually was a flood, there actually was a Noah, and so forth. Other civilizations know about it. This lends credibility to the gospel accounts. Everybody knew about this stuff in the Middle East. But the scriptures give us the theologically correct interpretation and historically accurate record of it. Bearing in mind, it's not written as history. It's written as narrative with historicity, a true story that interprets the history. The Gospels are no different. When we read the Gospels, we have to understand that John and Matthew were written to Jews. Many books in the New Testament were written to Jews. Hebrews, Peter's Epistle, Jude, Epistle of James. That does not mean their content does not apply to other believers who are not from a Jewish background. But it does mean, in order to understand how it applies, you have to understand what it meant for the people to whom it was written, the Jews of the first century church. John is a more evangelistic gospel. These things are written so that you may believe. It has an evangelistic appeal primarily to Jewish people. And it claims not to be a history book, even though it has historicity, even though it's a true story. It says if everything Jesus did were written down, all the books that existed at that time couldn't contain it. Okay? History's got to be comprehensive. It's not written that way. It's written as a narrative that interprets the history. It's written as a true story, not as a historical account. So, you only put certain detail, you only include certain detail to bring out your theme and to make it relevant to the people to whom you are writing. There is Judaic content even in Luke, but Luke is predominantly written to the Greek world. Luke was a Syrophoenician Greek convert to Judaism. He wrote his history in a linear format, or he wrote his narrative, his interpretation of the history, in a linear format, because he was writing to non-Jews, to the Greco-Roman world. The Judaic content in Luke is there because Jews would have known that stuff. He had to teach the Jewish stuff to non-Jews. For instance, in the Olivet Discourse, in Matthew 24, there's no chapter division in the original text. The preface to Matthew 24 are the closing verses of Matthew 23, where Jesus predicts the destruction of Jerusalem, and he tells the Jews of Jerusalem, you will not see me until you say, Baruch haba b'shem Adonai, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. That's the literary prologue or preface to the Olivet Discourse in Matthew. He puts it at the beginning. In other words, Jesus says, for him to return, the Jews must be back in Jerusalem and recognize him as the Messiah when he comes and say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord from the Hallel Rabbah or from the Hoshana Rabbah, the Hebrew Machzor liturgy. 
That's written to Jews. Luke takes the same truth and puts it in verse 24 of Luke 21. Jerusalem will be trampled down by the feet of the Gentiles until the time of the Gentiles is completed. How do you work this out? Because the Jews reading Matthew would have known about the book of Daniel. Matthew explains Daniel, one Messiah, two comings. The first coming, then wars and desolations are determined to the end, then he comes again and at the end and there's a rescue, a rapture. Jews would say, oh yeah, that's what Daniel meant. Greeks and Romans would have no sense of that. They're both telling the same story. They're both relating the same truths, theologically and doctrinally, but they're emphasizing different detail to develop their theme and to communicate it effectively to their target readership. That's how we account with these apparent discrepancies. Let us look at the genealogies of Matthew and look very briefly. Some people, certainly rabbis, who are opposed to Jewish belief in Jesus, Operation Judaism, people like this, and liberal scholars like to highlight, amplify the apparent, apparent discrepancies between the two genealogies. Well, those discrepancies you see between Matthew and Luke are no different than the kinds of discrepancies you see between the genealogies of Genesis and Second Chronicles, most likely written by Ezra, of the Jews that came out of Babylon, but it traces it back to Genesis. There's a discrepancy. Why? Because Ezra is only including those ancestors of the Hebrews coming back from Babylon that are important to the theological theme he's trying to develop. The gospel genealogies are the same. There's only apparent discrepancies. Matthew's genealogy begins in the closing verses of Ruth chapter 4, the house of David. It shows the royal line from the tribe of Judah of King David because the Messiah would be the shortest Ishai, the root of Jesse. And so where Ruth 4 leaves off, Matthew 1.1 picks up. Okay. It's written to Jews, showing Jesus as the Davidic Messiah and introduces some more complicated issues like the curse on Jeconiah. He could not be a descendant of Jeconiah, but he's in the bloodline. That's Matthew. Luke is written to non-Jews. He doesn't trace it back to the ancient Hebrews. He traces the lineage of Jesus back to Adam, going the opposite direction. Huh. Traces it back. Matthew traces it forward. Okay. One is Adamic, one is Davidic. The Lucan, the one in Luke, is Adamic for the human race, going back to Adam and Eve. The Davidic one is in Matthew, based on the closing verses of Ruth chapter 4, right in the synagogue on Pentecost, the Feast of Weeks, Haggah Shavuot to this day. Now, when you understand that, you see why they're different. Matthew includes those ancestors of Jesus, important to the theme he's trying to develop, that Jesus is the son of David and the Messianic king of the Jews. Luke is trying to show him as the universal redeemer. He includes other people that Matthew doesn't. Also, to get around the curse of Jeconiah, 
the bloodline had to come through Mary, the Talmud of all things, and Sanhedrin 25 Gimel, 25C in Sanhedrin, says Miriam Bateli, it Mary the son of Eli. So where it says Jesus was supposedly the son of Joseph, the rab ancient rabbis understood that the genealogy in Luke goes through Mary, while the genealogy in Matthew goes through Joseph. Joseph is a Leverite line where somebody would procreate a son on behalf of the deceased brother. Again, this goes back to the book of Ruth. So by Leverite marriage, we understand why Matthew includes certain ancestors and omits others. He also attempts to structure it in bi-Sabbatarian sections. 14 generations, then 14 generations, then 14 generations. Now actually, it's more than 14 generations when you read Chronicles and when you read Genesis. However, he structures it that way. He only includes the ancestors important to show who Jesus was as King Messiah. From, from the patriarchs to David, David, the, the loss of the throne, that the, the throne of David, Babylonian captivity, in other words, and then it's going to be restored by the Messiah in the millennium. He breaks into these three sets of 14. Luke is not primarily concerned with that. Now, Jesus had to be a bloodline descendant of David. He couldn't be through Joseph. Joseph was his foster father. Therefore, Mary also was a descendant of David. So you have a genealogy, one is patriarchal and one is matriarchal. In the Old Testament, you have the daughters of Zelophehad, or Zelophehad. There are other cases of matriarchal genealogies in the Old Testament to set a precedent. Because some rabbis would try to argue, it doesn't go through the mother, it goes through the father, but now they say Jewish identity goes through the mother. So you got them, that's their claim. The scripture says it could be either, but they say, no, it's maternal. So they can't throw it out and say, no, no, it should have been through the father. No, you rabbi say Jewish identity is through the mother. The Gospels cover both. You have the Leverite, the legal line, which is also the royal pedigree line in Matthew. That is also the Leverite line. That is also the patriarchal genealogy. Luke has the universal genealogy going back to Adam. He's the savior of both Jew and Gentile. And it is matriarchal. Miriam Bartheli. Joseph's father was not Eli. Eli was just simply a Greekization, combining the word for son with, with the name Eli, my God. They emphasize different things for different reasons. I hope I'm not being too complicated. That's the reason the Gospels differ. You'll see all kinds of variations in accounts. Does he heal one blind man or two in Jericho? Is it only Zacchaeus or somebody else? Or the, the, the short man? Or what about Genserine? Is there one demoniac or two? Well, there was two. But one account only emphasizes this one because it's important to the theme that gospel author was trying to develop. But as you read Mark 5 and 6, you get another variation of the same account. You get the same things with the Sermon on the Mount and the Sermon on the Plain, which is in Luke, Sermon on the Mount in Matthew. You get the same things with the feeding of the 5,000 and so forth. 
each writer includes the details that are important in developing and explaining and communicating the theme he's trying to bring out under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. You see the human character and background of the evangelists of the gospel authors, as you do the apostles, as you do the Hebrew prophets. Remember, it's 100% the word of God and 100% the word of Matthew. 100% the word of God and 100% the word of Mark. 100% the word of God and 100% the word of Luke. 100% the word of God and 100% the word of John. Jesus was not 50-50. He wasn't half human, half divine. He was 100 and 100. So the Gospels, the Scriptures, are 100 and 100. What liberal scholars do is simply try to read it as the word of men. What John wrote, what Isaiah allegedly wrote, and, and analyze it on that basis, usually in a distorted way. Uh, no, no, they're seeing half the picture. They're not seeing the whole picture. It's 100% the Word of God also. We can explain these things comprehensively when we understand it's both the Word of God and the Word of man. That there's a different target readership and that each author was inspired to develop a different theme and explain the different doctrines. Remember, it is a narrative with historicity when you read the gospel. It is a true story. Its purpose is not to tell you the history of Jesus, even though the historical detail in it is historically true. Its purpose is not to teach you the history of Jesus. Its purpose is to theologically interpret for us the history of Jesus. That is the basic explanation of why certain authors stated certain things and certain authors stated other things, while one would include certain details and another would exclude it. Now you've got these again, liberal higher critics, who try to say, see, it contradicts itself, this says there's one, this says there's two, it's all you. Well, the problem in the story of liberal higher critics is a whole issue in itself. What's wrong with their way of thinking? I would recommend the brilliant essay, Fern, Seed, and Elephant by C.S. Lewis as a beginning point to understand the folly of higher criticism. Nonetheless, I hope this answers the question, at least basically, and I hope it wasn't too boring. Thank you so much for your questions. God bless you. My name is Jacob Pash. This time, I'm in the USA. Thank you, Jacob.